So now we have two more technical or technological sessions. If you remember, we started on the framework, then the importance of the roadmap, and then the details in four sessions on technological perspectives, challenges, and, and objectives. Now, the two sessions for this afternoon will begin with the hard to abate industrial processes. They are, we are talking about directly 15%, but indirectly much more than that of the total emissions. Only three words, steel, concrete, and fertilizers, three completely different areas of activity that are very intensive in carbon and requires serious uh, revisions. Uh, today, we will be unable to address everything, but good examples will illustrate how to move in this session. Fernando. So this third panel of today will be moderated by uh, Mauricio Masi, who is the head of chemical engineering department in uh, Politecnico de Milano. And uh, I will leave uh, Mauricio to present his, uh, his yes, panelists. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, the rest of the panel, uh, we have uh, Alberto Abadanes uh, from uh, this uh, university that is an expert in uh, energy uh, technologies. Fabio uh, Cirillo, that is an uh, eco-efficiency consultant uh, at uh, uh, Botatarium uh, Cementos, a uh, Brazilian cement company. Then we have Martin Pei, that is executive vice president and CFO technology office uh, for SAAB, the Swiggy Steel. Uh, and uh, by the end, uh, Giulio Friedman, that is senior research scholar of the Columbia University that is uh, uh, involved in the global uh, clean energy uh, policy. So uh, starting uh, from the beginning, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of what was the the work we had done uh, in April in Milano, discussing about uh, almost a very uh, heavy challenge in operations to, to decarbonize uh, the heavy industry. And uh, what, it's not changing. Okay, this one, okay. So we are focusing on heavy industries, uh, where we have emission of greenhouse gas uh, from directly from the thermal emission but we also emissions that are coming from the chemistry of the processes that are involved. And also this kind of industry has the general emission that are related to the indirect emissions of the logistics of the raw material and to the final products. Uh, two kinds of industry. One that is typically the industry of the automobile, the food and beverage industry and many chemicals is using energy for the logistics and for the processing, but there is not directly emission of uh, greenhouse gases uh, from the chemistry. While uh, uh, other industry, like the one that we are going to address here, have also emission that are coming from the chemistry of the process involved. And that is really a tri no trivial challenge to try to decarbonize uh, those sectors, because it means to have a very big uh, change uh, in the process which are the real uh, critical, from this point of view, processes. Are the processes when we are uh, producing cement, uh, all the processes that we had the reduction of ores for the iron and steel, and uh, most of the petrochemicals. And uh, we have, so in both cases, direct thermal and chemical emission of greenhouse houses. And uh, we already learned that uh, most of the work in the future will be done uh, in uh, the electrification of the energy source of many, many sectors. In those kind of industry, it's not possible simply to obtain the decarbonization by changing the fuel. So we must do something in addition. And uh, which are the goal? Uh, we are emitting practically uh, the 21% of the overall greenhouse gases today, and uh, we are uh, uh, increasing uh, practically uh, 2050 our necessity of this kind of goods because uh, population is increasing and all uh, people need to have goods. So we cannot say the people that are 
uh, coming to the world today, they cannot access the things that we have uh, the possibility to have in our generation. And uh, so, which is the problem? If you are looking to the projection of the International Energy Agency at 2050, we can see that uh, the number are significantly different uh, to the number that we need to maintain the, the temperature increase of 1.5 degrees centigrade. So we need to do something. Fuel switching is not enough. And uh, also the business, as usual, uh, considerations are uh, uh, not even uh, to be considered. So what we can do, uh, which are uh, the limitation why we cannot uh, uh, do in a simple way. Uh, first of all, it's natural. All the electricity that we are using in this kind of industry should come from uh, uh, low or zero emission uh, electricity. So that is the, probably the, the step that is uh, the easier to be done. The second problem is related to the natural uh, overcome of the technologies during the years. We are used to change a mobile phone every two years. We can change a car every five years, but we cannot change a big steeling plant or petrochemical plant with such a, um, a speed. Those kind of plants, they last uh, at least 50 years. So we need to do something in revamping what is existing and in uh, introducing the new technologies in the, in the new one. Also, there is one other problem related to the complexity. Most of those kind of industries are really interconnected. So interconnected and uh, it's very difficult to change a single process without affecting all the others. So it requires a real a systemic change. So we are facing a challenge like what was done by the chemical industry uh, during uh, uh, the first year after the Second World War. So the changing from the chemistry that was coming from coal to the chemistry that was coming from oil. So we need to have probably the paradigm on new chemistry that is coming from natural resources or from wastes, and uh, we're going to use the electron as part of the reactions. Uh, so, our technology in which we are looking for are the electrification, the use of biomasses, the use of hydropower, and the use of carbon capture technologies. All the barriers here are not that we are not knowing how to do things. We have barriers that today are fully of economical uh, nature. So we had to do action to reduce. Uh, one, uh, especially for the chemical sector, because in metals it's much more easy to do, we are uh, really to address the point of the key technologies about the recycle. And uh, simply to consider, uh, like let's keep this one, the recycle, for example, today, of plastics, that is really a, a key action. Uh, all uh, what will be done for the cement and uh, steel will be addressed by the colleagues that are more expert than myself, and I'm skipping this table that is the real the results. Uh, I want to uh, really uh, consider which are uh, the limitations that we have uh, in this uh, heavy industry sector. Uh, we are looking only on the carbon footprint, but many issues related to the carbonizer include also land and water consumption. So if you are moving, for example, to the use of uh, fossil fuel, to electricity that is coming from renewable, and let's consider, for example, photovoltaics, we are consuming land. So we must to have the social acceptability of the people that want to have uh, mm, renewable energy generation close by their homes. That is, in a country, that, for example, Italy, that is really crowded and overpopulated, it's very difficult to let the people accept that you are installing such kind of facility near their home. And uh, so, integration in this field is uh, critical, and so what you have to do is really have something that is able 
to solve the problem in a systemic way, like the one that we are trying to discuss here. Because we cannot try the to find a solution for only one sector and live uh, in alter the others. And uh, so we need uh, really courage and, uh, and hope to, to try to do this kind of uh, change in, in such a low limited amount of time. Because 30 years in the heavy industry is really nothing of time. So it's, uh, it, it is very short amount of time. I want to uh, consider one point of the chemistry because uh, the other aspect uh, will be done by the colleague, and in particular, which is the action to reduce the emission from the chemistry. So the, the world today is what is called green chemistry, and uh, the problem uh, we must really de be able to, to consider, which is the difference between green chemistry and the green washing that is uh, usually done uh, to, to try to, see, to do something, but without doing anything. And uh, so we are now doing a chemistry that is called what is called green in the brown, so reduction of the carbon impact of the traditionally oil-based uh, uh, technology. But we want to arrive to what is called green green, so use the uh, bio stocks uh, or using um, raw material that are coming from the circular economy. We are producing more waste than what we are producing as new, as new material. Uh, and also, uh, we have to consider that business and consciousness drive the innovation. If you consider that the chemical industry is uh, using a lot of energy, saving energy is uh, business. Mm? So that is driving a lot of innovation also today. And, and concluding, giving a number, this is a number of hope, uh, just released that uh, the Italian chemical sector is already ahead, for example, for the European emission limits uh, to 2020 and also to those of 2030. So when you try to do an action and you see that you are gaining money, the action is, is fast. So I'm concluding here, and so I'm uh, giving the stage uh, uh, to Alberto Abadames, that is uh, giving the speech by uh, the front door. Hey, thank you. So it's a pleasure to be the first of the five or four women, uh, men here. <laughs> Sorry. Well, uh, as I'm here in, in my house, so I, I will give the talk. I, I stood. So, I want to talk about this technology that unfortunately has not been mentioned anywhere except in a small slide given this morning uh, that is called the direct decarbonization of hydrocarbons that it was in fact very enthusiastically described by, by a journal, by a journalist in fact, in the cover of the, of the of New Scientist, this, this uh, uh, scientific uh, journal, as the reaction that will change the world. So maybe it's very optimistic, right? but everything changed the world, even a little small butterfly changed the world. So one of the things that we have to take into account is that the hydrocarbon is a basic resource of our society. Mm -hmm. So it's a critical issue for the long, uh, how to use these uh, basic resources are a critical issue for the development of our society in the energy sector, that is mainly what is focused here, but also in many other sectors, the industrial sector, that now is very hard to abate, and is really a key ex sector for this. Mm -hmm. They use a lot of hydrocarbon. Natural gas, of course, has been mentioned here, that will contribute in the future, uh, uh, constituting not only, not only a, a feedstock for, for energy, for the energy sector, as uh, the, the transition to the, uh, to the green economy, but also a feedstock for a chemical industry and that has a lot of uh, resources coming, coming from, this, from this source of, of hydrocarbons. Mm? So innovative solutions should be put into practice for a carbon neutral exploitation of these hydrocarbons. That of course, when I talk about hydrocarbons, I'm talking about natural gas, I'm talking about fossil fuels, but of course, biogas and bi bio, biofuels. They are also hydrocarbons. No? 
depending on the, where they came from, they can be considered green or brown. So, uh, and also I believe that direct hydrocarbon decarbonization may be part of the solution to control greenhouse gases emissions in the short medium term. At least to control this, because uh, as you know, we need everything now. So what is that, the decarbonization? Decarbonization of methane pyrolysis is a reaction, a simple reaction like this one, you have the hydrocarbon, and this is the case of the, the simple one that is uh, methane. And this, this uh, molecule is split into the basic components that are carbon solid and hydrogen gas. This, this source of, 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 of methane, or sulfur resource, will come from natural gas, can come from biogas, and can come from synthetic natural gas or synthetic, gas, synthetic hydrocarbon. Of course, this reaction is uh, endothermic. So we need energy to fulfill this reaction. And this energy is thermal energy that could come from hydrogen, direct from hydrogen that is produced at the end. So around 15% of the hydrogen that we produce is needed for the reaction either solar energy, mixtures of uh, hydrogen and, and natural gas, or even, of course, natural gas. Any kind of thermal energy. And the products are hydrogen and carbon. Hydrogen that can be used, as you already know, for fuel synthesis, for clean fuel synthesis. In this case, because there is no CO2 production, there is no oxygen, so there is no CO2. Uh, for energy delivery as uh, energy vector, or, of course, as industrial commodity for ammonia production, has been here a lot of times discussed about ammonia as fuel in, in ships. So ammonia production, also for agriculture and so on. And the carbon, of course, is what we want that could be. It could be just a mean of a storage carbon or a mean of material or, or something for material production as a graphene, graphite, materi graphite materials, all this kind. So in this case, I'm being a little bit unpolitical to say that I'm not talking about the carbon-free technology, but a carbon-full technology, because it's carbon at the end what you have and no CO2. So, uh, and carbon is a critical material for the circular economy. So we are not uh, also limited to the energy sector. We are also going go ahead and going into the circular economy in which low-carbon technologies to use this, these fossil fuels could be, could be, or these hydrocarbons could be used for hydrogen that is used in many chemical processes that I already mentioned, and also the production of graphite and metallurgic carbon that is a material, a very novel material, that in fact is the base of the nature. All of you are carbon units. In some, in some film, eh, the, the, the robots or the uh, artificial intelligence consider humans are, as carbon units. No? Carbon, it could be a material of the future in which it's supposed to be a, a, a growing, a, a very, very fast growing of the demand for new, new technologies, as, as uh, even for batteries, hmm? or for uh, carbon-based materials and so on, graphene and so on. And this technology could be very well integrated in something that is critical for the energy transition, that is the power to gas concept, power to gas scheme in which, uh, I hope you, most of you know, as has been also mentioned, in which the storage is done basically in synthetic natural gas using the existing natural gas infrastructure. So we have energy coming from wind, photovoltaics, any kind of renewables, that of course is by electrolysis converted into hydrogen, and this hydrogen is uh, used to produce synthetic natural gas using the CO2 that is previously capture because, of course, in this, in this uh, methanization, this natural gas, when we use this natural gas, it becomes, again, CO2. So this is the basic power to gas concept in which we can integrate this kind of technology as it's a technology that transfers directly hydrogen, methane, eh? and methane into hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can use this downstream, so just in the, in the position uh, of the user, in which we can produce with synthetic natural gas, we can use synthetic natural gas and produce hydrogen for the industry or for the heat energy production, and we obtain solid carbon, or we can use this down upstream to support the electrolysis production uh, of hydrogen eh, by the use of uh, a source 
of methane to provide the methane, the, the hydrogen, sorry, when there is no availability of hydrogen production. So this is basically the upstream concept. So as a conclusion of my talk, and I see that I'm perfectly on time, so uh, the transition for a low carbon, low CO2, I don't want to say low carbon because it's low CO2, eh? because we can say low carbon plus oxygen economy, you know, society must be, this, this transition must be done as fast as reasonable as it do, you know, as possible. Avoiding social, economical, and environmental problems. As he has already mentioned here, the problems uh, in, in several countries because of the taxes, of the price of uh, energy, or whatever. Innov innovation and technological development may integrate hydrocarbons into the circular economy to control this greenhouse gases emission. Hmm? And hydrocarbon decarbonization is a technology that is now under development. I don't say that this is a solution that is already now commercial, of course, it's not. Hmm? But eh, it could be in the, in the short, medium term. Eh, can uh, help to reduce drastically CO2 emissions. And also, natural gas decarbonization is easily introduced in the circular economy to produce at the end something that doesn't produce waste. You have hydrogen that is used for something, you have carbon that is used for something. That is even a new technology that will become in the future in which, for instance, you can have a lot of carbon-based materials to, you say, to build the electric cars instead of aluminium, instead of, of steel. Hmm? You have uh, carbon-based materials that are used for storage, even electricity storage. Hmm? And you have hydrogen that is, will be used for, uh, for an industry like uh, ammonia production or any other industry using, using hydrogen, a part of the petrochemical industry that, of course, uh, needs, requires hydrogen to produce more energetic fuels. And this is the conclusion of my, of my talk. Just as a reminder, this, this uh, technology was awarded with the German gas industry in R&D in December 2018. We got the second prize in the business area competition of the European Institute of Technology raw materials, so I'm not talking about energy, this is raw materials for the carbon, you know? And uh, we've also got, with this is our starting point, the second prize of the Novatech uh, UPM uh, challenge, mm -hmm. competing with other technologies, as for instance, uh, health uh, technologies and so on. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Alberto, for the perfect time. So I, I'm giving uh, the stage to uh, Fabio Cirillo uh, from uh, the Votaramium Cementos. Uh, hello, good, mo uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Fabio Cirillo from Votorantim Cementos. Uh, it's a pleasure, thanks for the invitation uh, to be here and uh, to share a little bit of the uh, in initiatives that Fotorantin Cementos uh, is doing to decarbonize the, the industry, and also talk a little bit about the challenges that uh, we have ahead as a, a cement producer, okay? So I think it's clear from all the discussions that we have this morning that we are in front of uh, one of the main challenges that humanity has uh, had in the, the, uh, ever, so we need the action, we need uh, also uh, reflect about the daily uh, activities of uh, each one of us. I think we are in front of a, 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 a huge challenge, in fact. And uh, just to bring a little bit about Votorantin Cementos, uh, we are a, a building material uh, company, so we produce cement, concrete, mortars, aggregates, and we are uh, in 11 operations in 11 countries. Uh, Brazil is our main market. And uh, we, our commitment to sustainability is really strong. So uh, as a company, we were part of the foundation of GCCA, that's the Global Concrete and Cement Association. Uh, it's a CEO uh, level uh, organization that brings together uh, all the cement sector, nowadays we have 40% of representation of the cement produced in the world together in the GCCA, 
So looking for sustainability in cement production and concrete, uh, bring innovation and set the, uh, the uh, um, and uh, transfer best practice between the members. Um, also, we are part of GRI, CDP, we have different actions uh, in sustainability. And uh, as we also have discussed this morning, uh, it's clear for everybody that uh, if, uh, if we keep the business as usual, the world will increase, the average temperature in the world will increase more than six uh, degrees. Uh, if we take all the uh, uh, NDCs of the countries, we, we still reach three uh, degrees in, in increase. So we really need the action and uh, we really need the new technologies to deliver this uh, challenge to have a neutral uh, CO2 world in uh, 2050. So bringing for the uh, cement uh, this, this challenge, uh, it's well known that cement has an important participation in terms of CO2 emissions uh, around the world. And, uh, and also something, uh, we have the population growing and also urbanization. Uh, 200 people are added to the cities every day. So it means that we need to build a New York City by month. So that's a huge, the, the, the challenge that we have to face uh, this scale. Uh, that the, the market needs to build new schools, hospitals, houses, infrastructure. And uh, we, we understand that uh, cement and concrete are important materials to deliver uh, and to, to meet these gaps. Uh, especially in, uh, if we think about the extreme events in this new scenario of climate change, uh, concrete is a, is a resilient material durable and then that can help a lot bring efficiency in terms of the if you take the life cycle concept of the production that could help the uh, delivering the, the the technologies and what we need to face this challenge uh, just to understand a little bit about the emissions from cement so we can also understand what are the possibilities to decrease emission 50 percent of the co2 from cement comes from calcination. So when we put the limestone inside our, our kilns and heat it up, uh, part of the, the molecule of the limestone uh, releases CO2. So 50% comes from the, uh, the process. And 40% from the fuel that we need to feed this kiln and heat the, our raw material. So. Uh, if you think about it to deliver, uh, how we, we can uh, go through this challenge, the cement sector uh, come together and we have a global roadmap. So this document was uh, built together with uh, uh, International Energy Agency and it sets the target for 2050 and which are the leverage that the sector need to implement to get to, to this point. So we had the global cement roadmap, the last one launched in 2018, and uh, a specific Brazilian version of the roadmap launched in May this year. Um, so what the roadmaps bring to us as target is we need to decrease the CO2 emissions uh, until uh, 2050 by 24%. Uh, considering also that the cement production is expected to grow from 12 to 23 percent. So it's a huge challenge. Um, it means that we need to live from 540 kilograms of cement, uh, of CO2 by ton of cement, by 370 kilograms CO2 by ton of cement. Part of this uh, is coming from our red uh, uh, technologies that we, we already have in place. Part of that depends on the carbon sequestration. So after uh, 2030, it's clear for the industry that we need to develop, or we need to have in place a red technologies to sequestrate carbon. Uh, in this uh, aspect, one, a good uh, initiative that we already have 
uh, inside the, the Global Cement and Concrete Association is the Innovandi. Innovandi um, is a research network that again brings together all the cement industry to deliver uh, new technologies, to invest together in technologies to face these challenges. Um, going to the technologies that are already in place and a part of this decarbonization for the sector, we can talk about the uh, replacing of fossil fuels by waste. It's something that we do a lot. We use a lot of uh, uh, dangerous uh, waste, biomass, uh, tires in the end of life, it can replace the fossil fuel and brings uh, important CO2 reduction. Also clinker substitution, so if you can replace clinker, that's the main raw material for cement, by slag, fly ash, uh, limestone, it's also an important uh, lever to, to decrease CO2. And this is just uh, a small uh, a little bit of details about the cement roadmap in Brazil. In Brazil, we have more opportunities in terms of clinker substitution and also the use of biomass. I want to share one example with you. And so we uh, depend a little bit uh, less on uh, carbon sequestration, what's good because the technology is still expensive and uh, is still in development. Um, I would like also to mention the importance of the financial market uh, in this uh, decarbonization. So we in Brazil were the first company to have this kind of operation that's a, a revolved credit facility. So what it means, we took as a loan uh, $290 million from uh, a pool of banks uh, and our interest rate is related with our performance in sustainability. So we have targets defined. If we meet these targets, uh, we pay less. If you don't meet these targets, we have a penalty. So we understand that it brings sustainability for a new level of discussion and it helps a lot the, the, the companies moving forward. Um, just going quickly because I am losing my time. Uh, alternative fuels nowadays, as the as Votorantin company, we are already uh, replace 18% of the fuel, the fossil fuel by wastes. Uh, uh, interesting example uh, using biomass that's really good for, for reducing carbon emission comes from the use of acai. Acai is a well known fruit from the Amazon. It's good for the forest because it uh, improves the. Um, the profits that the, the communities can make from the forest without cutting the forest. So, but uh, uh, most of the fruit, 80% of the fruit is the peats. And uh, what we uh, used to use nowadays is just the poop. So all these seeds were being landfilled and having problems. What we are doing is bringing these seeds for the, the, the cement plant uh, and using that as biomass. So in 2019, we are using more than 100 tons, uh, almost 100 tons of seeds a year, what uh, uh, there comes with a reduction of 117 tons of CO2. And if you also consider the uh, indirect CO2, uh, the CO2 uh, equivalent from methane, we are talking about more 200 tons of CO2 a year. Uh, cement tissues, we are also decreasing the amount of clinker. Pozzolan, uh, calcinated clay is, a, is an alternative as slag and fly ash will uh, be less available in the future. This is a, a product that can replace clinker and comparing with clinker it has 43% less CO2 emissions. Just to finalize my presentation, CO2 uh, capture important part of our role and uh, we have a pilot project in Canada that uses microalgae to sequestrate carbon. So we, we take the, the fuel, the, the flue gas, put direct in, in this, this reactor by photosynthesis, it, it, it becomes uh, a bio and then we can use it to produce biofuels or something else. 
So I hope this help uh, in this discussion to understand how cement can move forward in the aligned with Paris Agreement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fab. And now I'm giving the stage to Martin Pei from the Swedish team. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, am very happy to uh, present uh, an initiative that we have been running in Sweden since uh, three years back. Uh, the steel industry is one of the uh, uh, heavy industries uh, that is uh, regarded as a difficult to abate uh, sector. Uh, one of the main reasons for the CO2 emission from the industry uh, originates from the reduction of iron ore. And in Sweden, we have been working with this uh, process development work for many, many decades. Uh, and the blast furnace process has been developed to a point where we are running them very close to what is uh, theoretically possible. Uh, we uh, have uh, made uh, many uh, significant uh, development uh, steps. Uh, one of the major steps that uh, were taken uh, in Sweden was uh, done in the beginning of the 1980s. When LKB, the mining company, and SSAB, the steel company, together developed this uh, uh, very specialized uh, iron ore pellets that we can use in our blast furnaces, and it resulted in that we uh, shut down the plants in our uh, production site. So the iron ore pellets are now made in the iron ore mines in northern part of Sweden. And these are superb uh, quality, so we are making the blast furnace uh, uh, very, very efficient. Uh, that step uh, still is very unique today. If you look at uh, the steel industry, so SSAB runs all five blast furnaces without using Sinter. So we are now setting the benchmark for the European Union's uh, emission uh, right treating system. If you look at the graph uh, below on this chart, our blast furnaces are uh, among the best in the world if you compare with uh, different regions, but still is, uh, this is uh, still not enough. Um, the blast furnace itself, if you look at what we can do further, uh, the, uh, in the blast furnace, Today, we use uh, metallurgical coke and uh, coal that we inject as a fuel. We can still do some more uh, steps to improve the fuel consumption. If you replace the injection coal with uh, hydrogen or uh, uh, natural gas or uh, plastics, uh, recycled plastics, or use more electricity. Uh, that can be done, but still the, the coke can't be done because the furnace is, the process works with Coke. Without Coke, this uh, process does not, does not work. A further way to continue with using coal is to apply the CCS or CCU technology uh, that can uh, uh, partly solve the, 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 the issue. What we did uh, back in 2016 in Sweden, we decided uh, together SSAB uh, with uh, LKB and Vattenfall to investigate the possibility to use hydrogen instead of uh, coal to make uh, the iron ore reduction and then make steel. SSAB today is the largest company in both Sweden and Finland in terms of uh, CO2 emission. But in Sweden, we have also a very good opportunity because the electricity mix is today already uh, decarbonized and we have uh, plenty excess of uh, also biomass. So we decided to look into a process replacing coal using hydrogen instead. Uh, this was a study made back uh, in 2017. We came to a conclusion that the hydrogen-based uh, technology is interesting. So we decided to make a, a pilot plant uh, uh, investment project. Uh, we then uh, made uh, a further uh, study in the, on the way and decided to uh, really move ahead with technology. Now we have made a roadmap that we will shut down all our blast furnaces and convert into this new technology. And all the three companies will uh, decarbonize and get to a fossil free situation already in 2045. So this is our very aggressive time plan. 
and we uh, made uh, a start uh, of uh, construction of uh, the pilot, uh, pilot plant in northern part of Sweden, in Luleå, with the Swedish uh, Prime Minister. And we are now uh, doing this uh, uh, construction for the pelletizing uh, projects, starting uh, in the iron ore, making the pelletizing process uh, fossil free as a, a first step using bioenergy instead. And then we are now constructing the pilot plant for direct reduction using hydrogen. We're also making um, a project for hydrogen storage. So we are t going to test the line rock cabin technology to store hydrogen on a large scale. Uh, we are also starting test campaigns for uh, melting this type of um, DRI in an electric arc furnace in order to, to make uh, high quality steel. This is uh, the pilot plant, uh, the photo taken uh, last week. We are right now constructing this uh, pilot plant. It's a one ton per hour uh, capacity test facility will be ready next summer for testing this uh, new technology. So uh, we believe that the hybrid technology can uh, work and we are now uh, making plans for building the first demonstration scale facility which will be in operation in 2025. So our plan is to start introducing fossil free steel products in the market from 2026. Uh, this is a very uh, ambitious time plan, but we believe this can work, provided that we have the policy instruments uh, uh, supporting such a transition. So the Green New Deal, the European Union right now is working on, is going to be very important. Uh, we believe also that uh, the European Union's uh, uh, long-term uh, strategy and uh, also climate law will be important. Uh, the industry strategy uh, will need to support such type of uh, uh, transition. Uh, access to fossil-free electricity will be the key enabler for such uh, transition. And hydrogen infrastructure that is right now under discussion in Europe is going to be also uh, very important. At the same time, the hybrid project will also create a great opportunity to uh, make the hydrogen economy uh, established in, in many places. So this is uh, just a short uh, overview of uh, what we're doing in Sweden. This is a, a very, uh, say, uh, high ambition joint uh, project that uh, we are doing um, with the three uh, industry companies, SSAB, the steel producer, LKB, the iron ore company, and Vattenfall, who is uh, the Swedish uh, uh, electricity supplier. So we, we uh, are now uh, moving on, uh, making the transition uh, happening. So hopefully this will uh, inspire many others uh, to look into this uh, possibility uh, for the future transition of this uh, very uh, important industry. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And now uh, the stage of Julio Friedman that came from Columbia University. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. Me alegre mucho asiste a este simposio. Uh, we are in the industrial building, estamos en el edificio industrial. I'm delighted to be able to talk about this subject here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to be the guy who tells you all the bad news. So uh, let's start with the fact that I wanted to focus a couple of years ago on heat. I wanted to focus on industrial heat because I heard some idiots saying that we can electrify everything, and I said, I know that's not true, so what can we do? And so I said, let's go after heat. Heat's hard. Heat's a hard thing to do. Most of the industrial processes, including the industrial processes up here, start by melting a rock. If you melt a rock, you need heat. So what can you do? And it turns out that just the heat-related emissions from heavy industry are more than all the cars and planes in the world. Yes, you never thought of it that way. All the heat from heavy industry is more than all the cars and planes in the world. And I dare say we've spent a little more time thinking about cars and planes than we have about industrial heat. So the question is, what can you do? We can admire the problem, or we can try to do something. And so 
we started getting into this, and we realized a couple of things. First of all, heavy industry is not the industrial sector. A lot of people who enter the decarbonization standpoint think about it from the perspective of power, because they've spent their lives working on decarbonizing power, which is a good and important and virtuous thing to do. They're not the same. Most commodities are consumed globally, not locally. So a very small change in price completely affects market shares. Most of these companies are also working with assets that are extremely long-lived, as we heard earlier, and are also very expensive to replace. In addition, these are generally considered essential national industries. The steel industry in South Korea is not just something they do. It is a huge part of their economy. And most people don't see it. Most people see power, most people see cars, most people see planes and fuels, most people don't go to the store and buy 10,000 tons of concrete. So the question is, how do you get this in people's eyes and minds? It's a hard challenge. The really bad news is we do not have a lot of options, and the people up here have mentioned that, and they're working on good options, and I'm delighted to see it. But we don't have a lot of options, and we need better and more. And what we found most daunting as we started all of this work was that there was no data. There was no data. You couldn't go out and find it. Nobody goes out and buys heat, and they don't recognize it in the industrial settings, like everything's put, set forward in tons or kilowatts. They're not gigajoules. So, it was really hard to start working on this project. The good news, though, is that we have good news. First, some more bad news. Uh, the most important thing about heavy industry is the high temperatures required. This is what makes it so hard to electrify, and it makes it so hard to deposit the heat in the reactors. So steel starts at 1,200 degrees Celsius, cement is 1,450 Celsius. There are not a lot of options to do that. Biomass can do it with biogas. That can, that can hit that temperature. Uh, electrical resistance heating actually can reach that temperature. You just can't put the heat in the reactor, so that's a problem. Hydrogen can do it. Nuclear can't. Nuclear is not hot enough. So that's a pretty small deck. There's not that many things you can do. So we sent out to do a big techno-economic analysis. Please come to our website and download the report. These are the punchlines. I've gone through the first ones today, uh, and I'll sort of unpack the, uh, the later ones as we go. One of the things to recognize, and this has already been said, is actually when you look at the comparison of options for deep decarbonization, carbon capture and storage ends up being important. It ends up being the thing you have to do. If you want to get deep emissions, that's one of the things. Okay, well, we can do that. Also, low carbon hydrogen ends up being really important. We saw that already with Martin Pay's presentation. It's one of the things that we saw from Alberto Aravene's presentation. Low carbon hydrogen is important. There's lots of ways to get it. That's fun. In all cases, we're going to need better policies. The markets can't deliver this today. We just need a new set of policies that can protect domestic industries or provide large enough incentives to finance, do whatever it is we need to do. So, we had not seen anything like this before, so we made it. Basically, blue ones are low-carbon footprint, red ones are not so low-carbon footprint, and we just put it up in cost per gigajoule. This is everything. These are all the options. And basically, the, this line here, the first line is U.S. price of gas, and that line is European price of gas. So the first thing you should see is all the options cost a lot more than gas. That makes it hard. Okay. Another thing you can find is that many of the options need CCS. For example, low carbon hydrogen, the cheap option in most markets is CCS. And the reason why the low, that's true is because most places do not have cheap low carbon power. Sweden is an exception. Sweden does have cheap low carbon power. America does not. China does not. So that makes it hard to use there. And even things that you think would be straightforward, like biodiesel, or hydropower making hydrogen and stuff, like most markets, it just doesn't work. So, the good news is that this is something we actually can and do know how to do. So this is the carbon footprint for power in the United States. And this is actually, I'm sorry, not the carbon footprint, I, I pulled the carbon footprint slide, it's terrible, it's not even worth looking at. This is the, the, the cost. So this is what the cost for a firm industrial power contract looks like in the US. This is not a three cent per kilowatt hour solar panel in Chile. 
This is what the actual industrial firm power price is. So when you want power 90% capacity factor 24 hours a day, that's the price you pay, basically 50 to $120 a megawatt hour with a median price close to 70. So that's quite expensive actually. And we are not close to having zero carbon firm cheap power yet. So we need to work on that too. Lots of good people are working on that, we know it. But until we have this, electrification remains a challenge because it's not cheap or carbon free. So let's talk about hydrogen. I'm a big fan, I'm a big fan of hydrogen. We make hydrogen today at enormous scales. It's a globally used commodity uh, and it's pretty cheap. The cost of making hydrogen today is about $1.20 a kilogram and that's good. That for the record is more than the cost of natural gas by quite a bit, but we know how to make it at an enormous volumes. We also vent the CO2 from steam methane reformers today, that all goes up into the air and oceans and that's bad. If you wanted to capture that carbon, what we call blue hydrogen, you can do that today, it adds about 20% to the cost. That's more than people want to pay, but it's not like a huge amount of money. We would know how to do that. You can't do it everywhere, but you can do it in most industrial ports. You can do it in Rotterdam, you can do it in Texas, you can do it in Tianjin, you can do it in Teesside and Aberdeen, like there's places you can do it today because we have the storage. If you tried to do the same thing with renewable power, eh, in US markets, it's really unattractive and in most markets, it's, it's not gonna pan out. It's a factor of four in many markets, it's a factor of 10 more expensive, but that's okay. Green hydrogen is getting cheaper. The cost of electrolyzers is dropping, the cost of green power is dropping. Eventually, green power will be firm and the cost will be cheap enough to move into the business. And I look forward to that day. So we can start with blue hydrogen now, make hydrogen with no carbon emissions. And then as green hydrogen becomes increasingly cheaper, we can just bring it into the market as an on-ramp and make hydrogen go from blue to turquoise to green over time. We also just wanted to say, well, we've talked about these things in dollars per gigajoule, but nobody goes out and buys gigajoules either. They buy steel. So what do these things look like for real? And so we put in here just prices. If we took various kinds of heat, electrical resistance heating from the grid in the United States or from the grid in Europe, or if you use biomass, if you use really good blue hydrogen or not so good blue hydrogen, if you use renewable hydrogen, or if you just did CCS on just the heat, or if you did CCS on the full plant and got the process emissions too. That was, you're just like, what does it do to the price of the commodity? Because that's what people really want to know. How much more do we pay? So this is for clinker. And this is the price for 25% increase, 50% increase, 100% price increase. And that line there is $8 gas, which is, you know, Asia price or something like that. Okay, so most of these options more than double the price of production wholesale concrete. More than double the wholesale price. That's what the deal is. Interesting fact though, it does not double the price of the product. It doubles the price wholesale, but not the finished good. So for example, if you built a bridge out of concrete, because the bridge is mostly concrete, the price of the bridge goes up 1% if you double the cost of concrete. This means that government procurement is a very strong policy option because the government buys 50% of the concrete of the world. They could add this. Most of the cost of a bridge is labor and time and land and design and all these other kinds of things. Same thing's true for steel. Hello? Same thing's true for steel. Steel's not so bad, but steel's more expensive. Steel's 300 bucks a ton. So that's the price for European gas, 25, 50, 100% price increase. Again, the cheap options, CCS on hydrogen, great. And it basically adds quite a bit to the price. But again, if you double the price of steel, you increase the price of a car by 2%. The finished good is not that much more expensive. This gives us policy options to consider. Same thing with something like methanol. Here again, CCS ends up being useful. It ends up being cheap, it ends up being not so bad. So what are our recommendations? First of all, we gotta focus on this. 
There aren't research programs on industrial heat anywhere in the world. We should be working on this. That's a good thing to do. Second, we need more and better options. CCS is likely to prove important. I'm not satisfied with that. You shouldn't be either. We're going to need better options that are cheaper and more effective. And the last thing is we're going to need lots of policies, including things like government procurement, and they seem kind of effective and they seem actionable today. We need a whole lot more innovation, though. If we think we're going to solve this problem with the tools we have today, we're kidding ourselves. We know that's not true. And we need to work on this a whole lot more if we're going to solve the problem. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Fabio. OK, uh, I, I, I think we have a little bit of time to have uh, one question to everybody. But uh, in, in, in your estimation, which is uh, the real time scale we are facing in our business to, to have the decarbonization? For the steel industry, the uh, time uh, uh, aspect is uh, very important because uh, the facilities uh, normally are having an uh, economic uh, lifespan of uh, very, very long. For blast furnace, for example, uh, it's normally 15 years when you make a, a re reinvestment. It, it will run 24-7 for 15 years. And then you make a, a stop and then you make a new investment, you will run another 15 years. For a coke oven plant, which is the blast furnace process is based on, a normal uh, lifetime is uh, around 50 years. So if we really want to achieve the transition, we really need to start now. Because otherwise we will be locked in for another 50 years, which will uh, be too late. Right, I, I completely agree with that. That's also true for cement kilns. That's also true for petrochemical plants like ethylene crackers. They are very long-lived capital stocks. It's part of the reason why we focused on retrofit or modification of existing plants. Because if you wait until you replace the plants with a new kind of technology, we have real problems. So, uh, and again, hybrid being a notable example. In Sweden, the, the circumstances on the ground actually favor early replacement. But in fact, you, that's what you're competing against. You're competing against the teardown cost of an existing asset, and that's a very high hurdle. Um, I think in terms of the real timeline of this, we're probably going to have five more years of fumbling around while the governments of the world can't figure out how to tie their shoes, and EU tries to figure out how to balance between Spain and Poland. And you know that's real work, and it's a problem. After five years, everybody here is going to be at risk. <laughs> we, you know, we, everybody here is going to be at risk, and there's going to be some crazy version of carbon border adjustments or people lashing themselves to, you know, dump trucks. There's going to be some crazy extreme action. There's going to be volatility in financial markets. There's going to be questions about assets. The labor unions are going to get into it. It's going to be really, really hard. And uh, in that context, I think we have maybe five years to figure out what we want to do, and then we got to execute pretty much right away. Yes, in my, if I complement this, this answer, uh, one question is how long it will take for the industrial sector to abate uh, the CO2 emissions to a given point that could be useful for, for the whole picture. Because every sector is different. So you go to mobility, of course mobility, we have seen this morning, you can change the, the landscape of, of cities in 10 years between the horses and the internal combustion machine. Okay. so. Mobility, maybe it's, it's easier to reach uh, CO2 abatement faster than industrial facilities that requires investment of, 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 of decades to be really a return of, of the investment. So the question is, uh, if this, uh, uh, that we need to do now, because there are even some people that say that the, the degrees, that it will be reached from the point in the 90s, could be even Already, like we, what we have emitted now is 1.3 Celsius. So we have two, two, two decimals of, of error. So that means that we need to start now, to start now to do anything, everything, not only in this sector, in all the sectors. Some sectors will do it faster. Some sectors will do it slower because of the nature of the update processes. It's not the same to change a car than to change a factory. And, and then I also agree that uh, we have to move now with all the technologies that could be 
available. Everybody, so all the meat on the load, you know? Not uh, thinking about this is good, this is bad. Look, I have, a, I, have a, I have an illness, I'm sick, I take a pill. Even if I know that this pill has some effects that maybe are not the good ones they have at the end. Yeah, just to add something, I think uh, from the cement point of view, it's true, the same logic, but uh, uh, locally we have different options. We have something that we can start now that's already feasible, like fuel substitution, replacement for wastes, biomass, as I showed, uh, clinker replacement as well, work with uh, um, better use uh, efficiency in construction. We have a lot of inefficiency, a lot of... Uh, uh, wastes in, in, in the process of construction. We, we, we want to work with uh, the whole value chain to, to bring more efficiency. So these are things that we can start now. And then uh, different technologies that we need for the long term, uh, th then we have time like to still uh, to put efforts on that and to have that develop uh, 2030 or so when we really need that. Okay. I think it's time, so I let you to thank uh, all the group of these panelists. Uh, thank you for your coming and you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you.